like to invite our panelist, uh, Devin, Devin, please. Uh, Devin Eric, a partner at uh, uh, Shadow Factory, and uh, uh, Dave McLaughlin, uh, co founder of uh, Brink. And uh, uh, Greg, where are you? Yeah, please come back. They share two room and I share faces. All right. You can. Okay. <laughs> if you wish to be an idea. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, who do you want the uh, microphone? Anybody? I can talk now. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Good. Great. So, uh, Greg already introduced uh, uh, himself, uh, but uh, let me let me mention a bit more about uh, uh, about Bay and David. So, Bay is co-founder of a uh, uh, hardware and IoT incubator called uh, Brink here in Hong Kong. Uh, they are already uh, there third year. Uh, three and a half years now. Yeah. Three and a half years now. <coughs> seven startups uh, work life, including some of our past speakers like uh, Sam Banner, a wearable metronome, and uh, and Kelly, uh, a sleep training alarm clock. And uh, yes, so uh, and uh, David, uh, David and his uh, his partner Amit, who today is studying, they are founders of uh, the uh, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, production company, Shadow Factory, and they will talk to us uh, uh, about, uh, about the productions. Uh, let me start by asking uh, Devin to give a few introductory remarks about uh, his view of the world. I think he wanted to start by, by, by explaining what you see as a future reality in this way. Andrea, thanks for saying my view of the world. Because honestly, after doing VR all day, I don't know whose world I'm in anymore. <laughs> you're doing some of this. Ah, I see. Talk to you tomorrow. Good, good. Uh, next week. Uh, yeah. so, so thank you. I mean, I, you know, Greg, what you mentioned about startups not really focused, uh, not, not the, the whole startup ecosystem not being focused on hardware and having the software backer, and we feel the same thing from a creative industry perspective. A lot of people get involved in creative industries, and it doesn't work the same way in doing a software sprint. You have a different process, so it's neat that you brought that up. Uh, what I wanted to comment, you know, what we do, we're a production studio, so to sit on an IoT and hardware panel is a little bit interesting, because we actually don't deal with hardware aside from output. Hardware's our last thought. Right, and it's our discussion with a client or with a partner or somebody we're working with, how do we want someone to experience what's going on? What I wanted to remark and make clear today was the terms augmented reality, AR, virtual reality, VR, mixed reality, MR, are really misunderstood and overused. Everybody gets all confused the second they talk about it. And I think the video you showed was a good example. In that cat video, they probably showed five different devices people were actually using to interact with all that. And nobody would even know what to call it. I think of it as a spectrum. Over here, uh, actually over there where Andrea's sitting, we have the real world. And with each person, we're going progressively into a virtual world where you can be, and I don't even know my own name anymore, right? I may have Devin, we're all the same. We're interchangeable. <laughs> so, on the far spectrum, I have things like Google Glass or my phone, right? With baseball, we saw some very simple motion graphics coming over a data feed, coming over a video feed. That's very basic. It's quite static. It's something like on your Snapchat, you might have a filter that you look over. That's augmented reality. You're augmenting the visual that comes on your phone. But it's not very sophisticated. It doesn't do anything in the world. Going up in volume, going up in complexity, we have interactive programs like Pokemon Go, where you have like a little creature running and you can interact with it and catch it. We then go into virtual worlds, which pull data from the real world, right? So I could have a data feed going into an animation. New York Times did this very well with a, uh, with a VR exhibition of news, where they recreate news, pulling real news into an animated world. Finally ending up in a completely encased virtual world. These all use the same tools from a production perspective. These are all the same tools. So augmented reality is just that volume level of interacting with those tools where you still have the real world as part of it. It can be as simple as a filter looking over your image. It can be as complex as a little character or an interacting device or something like that. And that's what makes it so interesting with IoT. 
what effectively AR is going forward is design experience, user experience, right? If you have 20 devices around your house or 20 devices around your company, all connected to a network, all sharing and using information, and being analyzed and reviewed, everything that gets built into modern products and the way they're working, we as humans have a problem. We, we still have to understand it, right? We've always had the ability to do this. Since caveman times, we were painting on caves. We add a creative filter over our own world, and that's how we interact, and that's all that this is. So from our perspective, it's quite interesting. We approach the IoT world from exactly the opposite, sort of a mere view, and say, wow, all this stuff is happening. Now, how do I make it easy? How do I make it so a child can poke and make the Pokemon disappear? Right? So it's kind of an interesting way to think about it from one side versus the other. And I think as you're building your own hardware, your own IoT tools, now more than ever, it's as important to think about how somebody's going to use it, what's its purpose, how are they going to interact with it. If you're on a construction site and there's stuff flying around, there's lots of pressure, you can't make a mistake, you need to make it streamlined, easy to use, simple, so it can work. So that's the perspective we come into it. I'll let you guys talk about the other. <laughs> Sorry, Amit's a bit stronger on the hardware side than I. And Mike came, you know, a, a little more on the front and the, the creative end of it. But at the same time, I think it fills in nicely with what you guys do. So, so please, I just wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page. How we, how we view it. <laughs> yeah. I make stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I make everything. So, uh, you know, I've kind of covered what we do. You know, we've seen a lot of hardware startups, but, uh, but our background is development and manufacturing. And, so I'll do the quick intro of what we do and then I'll talk about my view on this side of the world. So we have three main things we do, it's very simple. We believe that it's our job to help us unlock data for the world so we can improve our lives. And right now, I'm sure all of you have heard these big jargon terms, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these things are supposed to change the world forever. And hardware guys like us, we know that you don't have any data unless you have hardware. There is no such thing as data without some sensor, some device that can extract that. So we start at the ground level. And similar, we work with founders all day. We have three main things we do. We have our community, come into China, where we support founders learning how to build their first hardware businesses. We have our accelerator, where we're now in three countries. We have over 30 investments, and we're very, very interested in four main areas, how we live, or sorry, how we feel, where we live, what we eat, and one more I'm missing, I'll tell you afterwards, sorry. <laughs> Always forget one of them. Uh, so the point is, like, what do we do with this technology? And it's human. Over half our investments are in health technologies. Because what's the point of all this unless you're around to enjoy it? What's the point of building technology? What's the point of trying to do anything if you're not there long enough to enjoy it? On the agricultural technology side, what we eat, it's really, really challenging right now. I'm sure you guys have heard a little bit, but it really scares us to see how scarce the world's food and water really is. It's a, it's a much larger problem than I think most of us really understand. Uh, in terms of where we live, the buildings, the objects. One of our biggest focuses are the buildings and the places we live all day long. So, oh, another one is how we move, sorry. So we have a drone vertical, where we focus on the last mile or drone or technology to help transport objects. And then the last part is where we manufacture products. So similar to Berkeley Services Group, we have a studio in mainland China. We support developing products because, again, founders have a hard time doing that. All of that is to say that we have a, an opinion on the world, which is there are things to fix. There's a lot of stuff to fix. And I think tonight's an interesting conversation because, like Devin said, there's a really cool range. And I agree. It gets complicated and it's certainly uh, misused pretty often. And I worked at Apple six years, and I always like to give this example, that no matter what's in these products, I will never give a shit. And I make this stuff work on stuff all day long. I don't care. I never cared about technology, I never will. I'm obsessed with my life. The experiences, the people that I want to have this experience with, the sharing that I want to do about those experiences, what processing power, how it's made, just something has to get done. So similar on the hardware side, the experience is what I really care about. Um, and I see two things that we're talk I talk about tonight. AR is going to dwarf VR by like magnitudes that are impossible to understand. Like it's it's gonna be everywhere on everything in the world. And then VR, on the other hand, has the ability to have an emotional connection, in my opinion, that's deeper than AR can ever be. It's immersive. I've spent lots of hours in his office 
doing crazy stuff like getting my head chopped off by zombies <laughs> and like all these crazy feelings like you can't do that when you see the real world. You have to be completely in a virtual world. I don't know where he found that zombie game. Right. It scared the hell out of me too. <laughs> I remember when you guys were going to it. Um, so, uh, and then I do think that there's an interesting aspect of IoT, which is how can we unlock the world, in the, or unlock the data in the physical world so we can start interacting with it? Because that changes everything all over again. So when you're moving around in full virtual reality, what if it can understand the room around you, the heat in the room, the airflow in the room, the humidity in the room? What can we do in virtual or augmented ways? AR is a little easier to understand. If you can just see the data coming out of everything, that's pretty obvious. But I do think that there's a range, and, and I hope that, uh, I don't know, I hope you guys are playing with it. That's one of my favorite things is you have iOS 11 on your phone, and you're not playing with AR right now, do it tonight. And it's something you can just start learning about right this second. You don't need a HoloLens or a Vive set up. Like, you can go to their office if you're in town because they've got crazy shit. It's really fun. Uh, they're upstairs. But you also can just use your iPhone right now and start trying to get a sense of what's going on. They just made a great point. I forgot to, I was going to mention it, but I forgot. The, uh, it's what happens at the end of the day, right? <laughs> uh, if you have Facebook on your phone, your phone is an AR phone, right? If you've got the new Apple iOS that's come out, your phone is an AR phone. Right? If you, if you, you, by next year, you're already going to have plug-in glasses that add, that are <coughs> ten times more powerful than Google Glasses was. Everyone sitting in here can already use it. It's already pre-built in. You didn't even have to update anything. So it really is something that's that accessible. Just people don't know. They don't know. They don't toggle it on. They don't actually play with it. Can I ask who's used AR on their phone yet? This hands. So that shit's changing tonight. Download the upgrade. <laughs> Play with it. yep. It's really fun. You can do stupid stuff like shoot hoops. Like put, I can put a basketball court like right here and shoot hoops virtually. You can play full like helicopter war games. Like you can do just about everything. You can bring in furniture. I can relay out the room in my way with shadow effects. Go walk and look under the desk. It's pretty nuts. The, the, the simplest is also one of the most mind blowing ones for me to take measure. I actually on my phone now can accurately pull a tape measure across the room. That simple. I can just start it at one point and edit it the next, and it, and, it, and it reflects directly. Something that you might need all day throughout your life, you just pull your phone and do it. So, it's definitely worth it. <laughs> Look into it. Okay. So, well, so I got a bit of a difficult task today, which is asking questions to, to these guys. I got a lot of, uh, a lot of things to say even without questions. So let me start. <laughs> so, we'll try to translate for you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wait. So uh, yeah, let me start by something, something different, something a bit of the origin of everything, which is about the, the hardware, the, the production or the design of the hardware that, that enables us to, to make the measurements and then are interpreted by the reality. So um, then we talked about uh, hardware production, hardware design before. We talked about the similarity between uh, uh, physical and connected hardware, because there are similar business models. But what, what about the hardware that is related to, to AR? What type of uh, uh, examples do you see today? If it comes to you for, for this hardware? Are there companies? Are there startups? Uh, mm -hmm. What's the scenario? The origin of the hardware? So, so we work with startups. So, and, and you know, you basically, I think in this world, you have the data, which Fundamentally, if you aren't a big company, you probably don't have the data, right? You can you can collect some data, but the real drivers are the Googles and, and the Apples and, and the, the big powerful companies that have access to tons of data, and they're using that to drive things. So if you're working with startups as we are, then you're really looking at the opposite side. You're looking at how do you collect that data to make it useful for other companies or for your customers and so forth. So. Uh, it's really about the sensors, it's about the boards, it's about the electronics, it's about these hardware products that we're building. And coming from that perspective, we work with this every day, and, and I, you know, getting down a little bit to the technical side is that, <clears throat> it's just some advice if you're a hardware startup looking to build in this space is understanding how this works, right? You can, and, and a few details you can build on the board, right? You can, and, just building electronics in general, I guess, it's, it's not that different, right? It, the, the actual fundamental technology behind this is not so different. But the things you should really be aware of are lead times of your electrical components, right? When you're prototyping 
and fundamentally, this mostly relates to the DFM stage. It's, it's very underappreciated, but when you're building a prototype, and you're building your board, and maybe you're using Arduino or Edison or something like this, and going from that to a manufactured product is a huge step. And you're not going to be successful unless you can really cost that down, unless you can really understand it. And so you want to, you really need to understand what is available in the market what those lead times are like, how you can design around that to your board. Um, you, the people that we work with, a lot of young engineers try to do this, and it doesn't work very well. Usually, we need to work with 20, 30-year veterans who know what is on the market right now, that they can take that original concept design and translate that into something that can work with machines and with available product and, and price that works. You know, we, we just, we're working, it's not an IoT product, but we're working with a uh, pretty interesting tortilla warming product. And you know, they did their research, they need to be at about an $80 retail price. They gave us their designs and we did a real rough quote. And the electronics pricing alone came in at $70. Okay, okay that's manufacturer cost, right? That, that turns into a three, dollars $400 product. That is not going to work at all, right? But we work with a, uh, one of our partners uh, who can put a lot more discrete electronics on the board. We can now get that down to, we're looking at probably about $12. So that, this is the kind of price range we're looking for. And um, it's a lot more in our in cost, right? A lot more engineering costs up front to, to get to that level. Uh, but you know, I think when you're looking at this from a manufacturing standpoint, these are some of the biggest tips that I can give is that you've really got to design for manufacturing. You've got to prove the concept first. You've got to raise the money. You, you need to know what the market will bear. And then you need to take that to real professionals that typically have 20, 30 years experience, convert that into a manufacturable design that can be affordable. Look, I'll make a comment that you tell me if I'm a completely like, off the mark, because he plays with this stuff in terms of the actual hardware, VRAR, all day long. So we, I was with a bunch of my investment buddies for lunch, and we're talking about this, because we've looked at a bunch of the AR and VR companies. Um, I don't see a near-term future where any startups touch an AR in a material way. And let me explain that. So Apple, you know, Tim Cook comes out, and you explain, but like, you can make AR glasses. We've seen some. Google fucked up the first Google Glass, right? We still have them, they've been collecting dust forever in our office. They were cool, like, ideas, but we know how bad it was, it was really, really brutal. And when they released the second version, it was like a sigh of relief. They're focusing on an industrial application, a business business application, which makes a ton of sense. And I promise you, the first time, which all of you will have this experience at some point, where instead of getting instructions, like the IKEA guy, and you're sitting there just frustrated, like throwing stuff in the ground, you try the fucking screw like four times, it doesn't work, you break stuff. You'll actually do your first assembly of something, like maybe as easy as a chair or hard as like a, a water pump or something, just walking step by step with AR guides. As I can oh, like, It's coming, it's coming. And your, 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 your mind is gonna explode like, why have I never had this before? Because you just wear the glasses and you go, insert the screw here, you're like, okay, look at it, goes, that's the right one, green, thank you, pick it up and you put it in. And so that that's coming and we'll all have that moment, but this is not space for any startup. And, and I think on the VR side, we've seen a lot of cool ideas in terms of small aspects. So we all know that Oculus got bought by Facebook, that's you know, one of the probably only examples that are really out there. Uh, HTC came from a very large company, um, but there are sensors that you can look at as a startup. You can look at components <coughs> of that solution in the room or whatever it is, but I personally, can't wait to be a rebuttal list, is uh, I don't see a lot of white space for startups in AR almost at all. Uh, in VR, there's more space, but you're fighting massive incumbents, and I think you're gonna take a small piece of that. So in, in general, I agree with you, and that is based out of the challenge of the process that Greg highlighted there. there there's there's so much complexity involved in visualization technology. You know, I don't want to go on too long about it, but I, Andrea knows I can sometimes do that. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> but, you know, 
a lot of the technology that goes into both VR and AR, right, including your, you know, your, your mixed reality, your HoloLens, holographic projection technologies, all, all this visualizing, tracking information, all this type of stuff actually goes back to Hollywood kind of in the late 70s and early 80s is where it really got started. When special effects started to get computerized, that's where you started building the, the, the software foundation layers for this type of information to be processed. That's very complex work, right? HoloLens just expanded their, their 39 degree field of view to 90 degree field of view, and they did that by having specialized refraction crystals shaped a certain way that they could split photons and have to replicate replicated. If you're not a PhD in you know, optics, their optical dynamics, you're not going to understand how that works. My caveat to what, what Bayes just brought up is not all startups form the mold of a Kickstarter, right? I do think this type of like modern day, I'm doing the startup, I'm going into the accelerator, I think they're great for a lot of things they do. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make fun of it or anything. It's, it is a good process. I do think this stuff is so specialized you're not going to get the, the, the junior startups. You know, the, the Oculus was was a was a was a once in a lifetime sale when that happened. We don't even know if that actually helped Facebook or lost the money. We'll never know because we don't have to know. Facebook has never report that. So that's one way to view it. But you know, I grew up in Hollywood. My whole family was 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 from Hollywood production families. The change in cameras, the change to digital imagery, all of that work happened with individual what we would call family companies, not startups for whatever reason we would call them, but they were actually startups. And you'd have some visualization engineer develop some new software tool who comes out, raise money from a very closed, very kind of specialized area of the world of industry, comes together and creates a new product, which then, can, then he finds the hardware partners to go. So I, I think startup and the mentality we're talking about it is this like Kickstarter new, I'm gonna go to China and ship through Amazon and drop ship and do all my other kind of crazy things that are going on. That, that's all, that's great. I think this stuff is way too specialized. If you come from that specialization, there's probably more money to be made in this than any other sector in the world right now, except maybe space. If we get into space race stuff, that's totally different. But other than that, if you understand this, if you're an engineer who has the background understand this, if you have the company contacts, one contract from Disney can be 10,000 little Amazon store sales a month, right? That's how much money can, can flow out of one single thing that'll come into this. That doesn't mean you can get that relationship, right? So there is room, but it takes a really specialized industry knowledge, it takes a really specialized set of connections. I always say, Go for it. If you, if you think you can do it and you think you've got the contact, it's worth a try. But be aware. Don't just jump on. I never, ever, ever say VR or AR is this type of thing that's just going to come on from like a, from like a, some sort of a go, go, GoFundMe type of campaign. This stuff is very complex, and you really need to know what you're doing. Well, let me play a little yeah. bit of that. Sure, sure. Yeah, you absolutely please. agree with everything here. Totally. Um, but at the same time, I think that complexity can actually lend itself to startups in a way where if there is a need that you have this special hand and it hasn't been addressed by the company. And, and let me, for an example, we're, we're working with a company that does um, 3D, 360 sound. So they've come up with just a very cool, simple way to record 360 sound that will enhance the VR experience. So does everybody know what 360 sound is? Has everybody heard that term before? Anybody? I'm um, sorry, yeah. Person. So it's basically just recording sound uh, in the 360 degrees, right? If, so if, if you sat in a movie theater, you kind of have an idea about this. When you hear something on the left tingle and then on the right tingle, that's not 360 sound, but that's the closest we can get to explain to you what it is. Right. It's really complex. <laughs> yeah. It, well, you know, it is and it isn't. Well, it, it, it is complex and it's fundamental. Yeah. Like an AR kit is working right now. Yeah. So you even saw the Apple's announcements. You can see that it is on the phone, and you're listening. There's a video game, and it's like, here's a, here's a wall, here's a wall, and I'm using my phone, and I start walking around the wall. There's noise on the other side. It will go quiet. So I'm in my phone, looking through my phone, and then there's like a canyon, let's say, like a wall, and I walk around. And there's noise from this side, like a car or a battle or something, and you move behind the rock, 
it'll literally go quiet. That's 365. It actually knows that what you're looking at, it's not even there, right? It's an augmented version of like the table you're staring at. But it knows what your phone sees, and it changes the sound of it. Yeah. We also do like demo settings in some games for iOS, like uh, the machines. You saw the Apple uh, keynote uh, a month ago. Uh, one of the AR games that they were showing there is called The Machines, and it's basically a tabletop version of League of Legends. Is that uh, what you would call it? Yes. And so you, instead of uh, having the field of play in your, your computer, you have it on a tabletop. And uh, in this tabletop, there are some obstacles, and uh, the sound is blocked if there are, if there are the sound of battle, if there's an obstacle between the battle and the sound of block. But that's already what can happen in, uh, in AR kit for, for iOS. Uh, yeah. Step back. Uh, let's talk about uh, startups. Uh, let's talk about uh, small players in this field. I, I can see one uh, because we talked about uh, uh, sensors earlier. And I can see one here, even though it's a suspect. I will, I will, I will ask him later. Let me first uh, ask it to, to you, Ray. Uh, this year, or the previous years, in your cohorts, uh, uh, which startups uh, uh, do you have in your accelerator that are directly related to uh, uh, AI? Zero. Meaning, uh, 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 and in direction, meaning perhaps sensors, measurement, control data, or is that too broad? No, I mean, there, I don't think there's anything that's necessarily AR focused from an IoT perspective. Like, sensors are doing their own work. Uh, but that's a real challenge. And having a uniform uh, language or, or framework that allows all AR, or whatever that is, and kind of my iPhone, and I'm saying, Oh crap, that's a Philips Hue light bulb. Oh shit, that's a Samsung projector. Oh crap, that's a different TV, like a Sony TV. That's not gonna, I'm not gonna see that. They have no incentive to expose that information. So they're, it'd be nice if they would, but that's probably not what's gonna happen. Um, but I think it just goes back to the other conversation. Like we've looked at these companies, we hear the pitches, I and mean, I love the idea. I'm like, hell yeah, you're gonna take on the Google Glass. Like, amazing, let's do that. And, I, and you, you think about it for five seconds, you're like, there's no way you're doing this. Like, it's not that, you know, even less, you have this stack team of PhDs, a shit ton of money, and you thread that needle just perfectly. So again, if you want to, go for it. But um, from our investment thesis, like, we don't like going against very clear disadvantages. Um, and when Tim Cook says, like, verbatim, that like a wearable product for, you know, an augmented reality that's reasonable for consumers is so many years away, like more than we expect it to be, I trust them. Like, I, I worked there long enough to know they don't make the same thing. Uh, then do you recognize uh, your people from uh, Shadow Factory being a technology company to being a production, com production company? Do you recognize your people in various companies? So, we, we were never, we did tech transformation consulting when we started. And that was a very broad term meeting. We did whatever we wanted for whatever people would pay us. Sorry, consultants, and that's kind of how it went. <laughs> uh, the reason we call ourselves a production studio is that very early on, and this goes back to that, that original comment you brought up, this idea of the startup model and how I look at my revenue, how I look at building my sort of ecosystem, my potential clients, all my platform, all my it, it, you know, the way that I'm going to grow myself and sort of gain a foothold before I start charging or the way I charge my fees and service, we realized very quickly that most of the world's VR companies did that and none of them make money. Uh, in fact, pretty much all of them lose money and burn people's capital really, really fast because they consider themselves a technology business. Uh, it goes in line. Part of that's hardware, some of that's VR software, but the reality is most people are not going to go out and buy a big VR headset and put it on their head every night. They're certainly not going to put their phone into a headset or somehow hold their phone up to their face while they're on the subway and drive around. That's just, that's just stupid. It's stupidity. People think people's habits aren't like that. People do things that make them more comfortable, that are easier, that take you know difficulty out of their lives every day, not putting it back in. So from the very basis, we said this, this doesn't make any sense. We said what does make sense is storytelling. And as it happened, we both had backgrounds in entertainment before being in tech and consulting on these things. 
And when we went back to entertainment, we said something that's very fundamental, and AR does this just as well as VR does, right? There's the, the productivity side of AR is very easy to, to conceptualize because of how many industries can take it and apply it. But the storytelling aspect of AR works very well also. And you can create games and stories and interactions around this, this, this type of a, of, a, of a portal, which becomes your phone or your glasses. The storytelling is fundamental. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it, because for me, that was the big leap in our company. The moment we said we are not a tech company, we want nothing to do with tech companies, what we are is a creative medium. We are storytellers. And here's this new way of telling our story, right? We're no longer filming Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader. Now we are Luke Skywalker watching Darth Vader come at us. Huge difference shift in the way that we structure ourselves. And then we built our business model on the traditional production studio model around that and start taking off. I think Pokemon is a perfect example, right? I mean, it's simple, it's easy, it's everywhere, it's beep, 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 everyone's doing it all of a sudden. And, 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 and that is, uh, it's that it's anything to do with the fact that Pokemon will go existing one year before, or one year earlier in the, in the form of uh, Ingress, is that the name? So essentially, uh, Pokemon Go, right. as you, you, you probably all know when it came out last year, it was exactly in the same shape and form existing one year earlier, again for Ingress, not successfully popular, but nowhere near uh, as Pokemon Go. It was really the story, the popularity, the, the, the fascination of the Pokemon characters that made that uh, uh, the application really, really popular. And then we did emphasize again on the we, story. We, we, we break that, uh, I, I saw this, uh, I was at uh, Baptist University last night, and this uh, head of, one of the heads of Disney research out of their Zurich office came to talk about AR, and it was really interesting, because he tied IoT into it in exactly this circumstance, where he said, look, he goes, at Disney, we created stories, and we in Switzerland have these series of mailboxes all over the country that everybody comes by, because they're always by buses. And he goes, we can't figure out, you know, what's the what's the people usage of patterns. We can't mount sensors to these things. Nobody will interact with it, even if they have the sensor for no reason, right? They wanted to do research studies around traffic flows to see uh, in, to base around these bus stops, and they realized they had these newspaper boxes at each place. So what they did was they created a game, a little known elf game. And that game became something where you trade money. So in each of the boxes, you can pull up your phone, and a little gnome comes out. And you can buy and sell little virtual currencies with them. And that ties into the geolocation of each of these mailboxes, which ties back into the research institute. So now, because this game's been going for about six months now in Zurich, it's mainly been based, and it's going around all over, they're getting a complete traffic map of the city. And they're seeing times and that people are spending there. They're seeing which places people are trading more or less. They're getting a, an economic model. They partnered with some, some research institute for economics about tracking the economic model. They've looked at the city transportation. And, and it, all of it was based off geolocation data, which your phone's package and which devices enhance and the way it works. And they had a simple little game where a little cheery note pops out when you trade with it. And that was it. All of a sudden, they turned it around. And for a minimum of investment up front from the research institution and from Disney's own sort of research area, they were able to start collecting this massive amount. So the, this is the thing. It's, it's one thing to look at like cat, caterpillar tractors and say, wow, well, that's cool. The ways that this stuff is starting to come out and interact with data, it, it's you know, people just haven't thought of it yet. There's lots of ways and uses with this stuff. I'll, I'll comment one piece of this. Like you guys, I'm sure a lot of you are interested in tech. I'm sure a lot of you are not. Uh, as I said earlier, I can give two shits. I really don't care about these things. I like tech, but I don't need this stuff. I just want my life to be better, whatever way I can find that. Um, and I think what Devin said is really, really critical. If you're a founder or you're interested in starting literally anything, uh, one of the founders at Indiegogo said this, and I, I, I say it all the time, it's something that really, really stresses me out when I talk to founders, is be obsessed with your problem, not your solution. And what that means is, when you pitch me your idea, and I go, so Apple and Google and Facebook are doing the exact same thing. How in the hell are you going to compete? Oh, but our sensors are better, and da 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 da. It's like, no, 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 no. How are you solving the problem better than Apple, Facebook, Google is going to solve that problem? And you're not going to beat them because your sensors are better. If you're obsessed with the problem you're solving, it might be scrap the hardware. It might be 
get a cherry little no to jump out of mailboxes and collect virtual goods. That might be the solution to your problem. Is I need to do X, Y, and Z because I have this problem to solve. Whether that's A, B, and C, it's F, G, H, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It could be an education campaign. It could be a service company. It could be a piece of hardware. It could be software. It could be a SaaS service. It could be a trading company. It doesn't matter what it ends up being. If you're obsessed with your problem, I just think 90% of founders I talk to, I'm sure you see the exact same thing, uh, they're just coming to us with these like solutions. They're so psyched that they're going to make. And it's like, cool. So what's the problem? They get so pissed. When we explain to them, we're like, cool. So I don't really think your solution is the right solution, but that problem's really interesting. But they keep trying to convince us of the hardware they want to make. And we're like, cool. So we're out. You know, like you're never going to survive if you're obsessed with your solution. Because it just, because me as a consumer, just doesn't give a shit what's in this thing. I don't care. It's a real natural phenomenon. It's like you have that aha moment. And you're like, wow, solution to this thing, and then. That's where it starts, right? You get on that path and you just focus on that solution and that solution and how do I make it work and what is the hardware behind it and how do I raise the money and blah, blah, blah. And, and, but yeah, it's not the solution that changes the day. It's, it's how you change the lives by affecting the problem. And um, a lot of times there is a better solution. And Most times. A lot, a lot of times. And so if, if, but it's really hard to see if you're just focused on the people how do you improve your solution? Normally, uh, normally now I would uh, ask for help from the audience uh, to ask you, uh, ask you better questions than the ones I can uh, uh, ask. But then I guess I'm about a silence. So normally I do the silence. So normally I do the opposite. I start asking questions to the audience. Myself, and then I get the same number of silence. So the time I'm going to ask the questions to a specific person who I think already he knows uh, who he is. And the question to you is: uh, Ambiclimate, is it or is it not an augmented reality company? Yet? Let me take give some background to every uh, to everybody. Uh, we saw how augmented reality and IoT interacted to the source of data, and there's many many companies, especially hardware that generate data, but it's not yet used uh, um, fully or in a very interactive way, and that's really not yet in reality. Uh, among our audience, we have uh, Jarvis who had uh, designed the, the, the enclosure of the second version of uh, AmbiClimate. AmbiClimate is Hong Kong's uh, Nest. Uh, Nest is a central heating controller for the United States where they do use heating. Here we can do some cooling, and the issue is uh, those uh, very aggressive uh, uh, air conditioners who sure. bother, uh, bother us every day, and whose remote controls are completely uh, you know, useless. So AmbiClimate is an uh, artificial intelligence. If you couldn't have uh, more acronyms today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, AmbiClimate is an artificial intelligence controller. It means not a remote control. You tell him a few warmer, a few cooler, uh, that's, uh, a few cooler, a few warmer, Eventually, the controller learns uh, the combination of temperature and humidity that makes you feel comfortable. So suddenly, you stop having to tell the air conditioner what to do, and AmbiClimate uh, tells it what to do. To do so, AmbiClimate, which is a small device that you put in front uh, you know, on the furniture in front of your air conditioner, AmbiClimate needs to know what's in your environment. Just like uh, that was mentioned before, imagine when uh, your AR goggles know humidity, the temperature, the wind, the, the, the condition in the room. Is anti-climate uh, uh, an AR product? Or, or <coughs> well, first of all, I, I don't think I'm allowed to speak for that because I don't represent, I don't, I'm don't. i not part of anti climate uh, company. Yeah, I'm an outside of the social sure. network. <laughs> uh, although we work long term. Um, uh, for now, I don't think it's, it's an augmented reality company. Um, maybe further down the line, it could be. But for now, it's, it's more of a uh, yeah, sensor, um, data, big data, and uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you, John. So who else here is working on sensors? Who else is uh, measuring that uh, with, their, with their devices or companies or, or plants? What was the question? Uh, who else? Sorry. Uh, who else here is uh, measuring that? Uh, who else here is producing sensors? Yeah. Uh, tell us about yours. Um, yeah, I think it starts with um, I guess the, the problem that we're trying to solve is for 
teams that are in the back country, adventurers in the back country, uh, where uh, it helps them communicate better, but to operate as a team more safely is kind of what we're trying to do. So we, we leverage some sensors, and again, there's uh, data that can be shared there, but we're in a situation where we're in the back country, so we're a, a no internet of things type of product. So, um, but that really doesn't make a difference whether you have the internet or not, we're still, uh, still transport data elsewhere that can be shared and people can act upon that data and either improve the team behavior or even save lives kind of thing. So it's kind of the nature of how we're leveraging the sensors. AR would work super well. There's actually a group out of New York we were working with. They do an alternative to GPS for yeah, exactly that. Well, like when yeah. someone goes deep under snow, they do signal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just imagine if you have a helicopter or a drone that can be receiving a different type of data and say, it's not over there, it's right here. Right. And actually lay it over so they know where to dig. Or equip a dog. Usually dogs you know, run out and they try to figure out where the dogs are going. They have a dog nearby and start trying to dig and figure it out. That would be really awesome if you could actually lay over different signals yeah. where there's no such thing as GPS, which happens you know, usually underwater or where there's you know, lots of interference. But yeah. yeah, I think that's like a cool combination of IoT plus AR. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense. But yeah, I mean, Amy Climate's definitely an IoT company, like certainly. A bit but AI, I think that's a good way of putting it. It's, it's a set of sensors that would be absolutely worthless without the intelligence that allows you just to say, I'm super cold right now, and then I'm a little bit too warm, and then it does all the rest for you. Like, that's the magic of that. It's not, it's not the fact that it has any sensors. Uh, sorry, can I ask um, But your prototyping company, okay. Do you have experience working with furniture? Who does some furniture? It does some furniture. Okay, good. Yeah, that's okay. No, no, no. Because, uh, we are trying to do some kind of furniture, but it integrates it in like a sort of technology to apart from looking very nice, you know, and stuff like that. So we try to probably make it in Shenzhen, you know, because there's electronics and there's no way you're gonna make it somewhere else. And uh, we have experience that, you know, we can discuss further about it. You know. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk. There's, furniture is an interesting market. There's a high duties and exporting to the US mm -hmm. and you're producing it in China. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, yeah, happy to chat. Okay, cool. Do you have any furniture or startups in your board? Uh, Unfortunately, uh, a bunch of corporates that own the rights to large like brand names that are integrating that. Um, I think it's I think actually a really underutilized play, like space right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be careful of creating at least just like feedback from like we've had a, we actually have like a standing desk company that we've invested in, and it's an aftermarket product which is super smart, but not smart enough. <laughs> it needs to actually be. Uh, you need to think about it from the sensor first, because uh -huh. um, obviously you're not going to sell a huge volume of that particular you know one. Mm -hmm. There's too much, there's too much variability in that particular supply chain. Mm -hmm. So think about it more from a modular design, and mm -hmm. think about it more from the sensor up, not the furniture down. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, I'm going to make this beautiful thing, and it's going to know you're sitting on it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> cool. So you can literally just slide a sensor under any cushion, and no one would ever know it's there. And that's probably a better solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually look at uh, uh, the, the bed is probably a great example. There's a shit ton of competition mm -hmm. in the bed space. Uh, Apple bought a company called Bed It. Mm -hmm. So it's like the problem is I want to track my sleep or I want to sleep better. So how do you solve that? Mm -hmm. Wearable. Mm -hmm. So some people are willing to do that. I fucking hate sleeping with wearables. This is the dumbest concept. I know people that do it. The Garmin people, I think it's a hardcore Garmin, the kind of like trainer. Like you'll wear these in bed, which blows my mind. Like the amount of times I go like this and I smack my wife and all this other stuff. Like it makes this doesn't make any sense to me. But then you can put something in your bed. Because that's what bed it was. It's like you know, lay this strip of sensors down. You go to sleep. That makes sense. Not bad. Then there's uh, eight, or it used to be called Luna, where the entire bed sheet is connected. And then there's entire beds that are connected. And then there's sensors that you put next to your bed and you use your phone. There's all sorts of ways to solve the same problem. So I think that actually would be good for you to look at from a, like why you're doing it. Look at a place like this, like sleeping in the bedroom has been attacked by like 17 angles of how to get the same thing done. So you get a sense of who's winning and who's losing and why. Man, there is. It's still wide open. I was CEO of a mattress company for oh, five weeks, so like, about two months ago. <laughs> And uh, we raised her out in like five weeks, and then the disagreement with the partner, which uh, happens often. But I'll tell you, it's amazing. There's a lot of money, a tremendous amount of money, but actually, it's still there's no great solution. So it's nice to love it. A very long time ago, I worked in China, 
supplying furniture and cabinetry to hotels all over the U.S. and in all of the West Coast. They just probably 10 years ago they already started trying to get these electronics integrated with those furniture. Your your real business problems won't come from designing the electronics. They'll come from the aftermarket services when they start to break. And you've got to go around and figure out a solution for how you're going to go get these awesome and custom designed electronics to be fixed and replaced. And you know, you sit in chairs, you roll around and lay down on beds, and stuff happens. And it's, it's uh, they looked into it, the company I was with at the time looked into it for a long time. And that I'm sure the electronics are better now than they were 10 years ago, especially coming out of China. There's been leaps and bounds difference, but at the same time, and that aftermarket service, when you have something that's going through that amount of wear and tear, that's good stuff. <laughs> and the comfort. Yeah, I mean, side sleepers, back sleepers, I mean, that's a lot of <laughs> yeah. dog and kids. Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we take a different angle for a second? So, just for fun, I would love all three of us, just because maybe you guys who would love this perspective, like, what's going to be in our life in three years? What's real, what's not? I think there's a lot of hype around these categories. <laughs> I think it's really hard, um, and I always like it when people that know more than me break it down a little bit and say like, okay, I hear all this stuff, like, what the fuck is really, like, what's going on? Like, are we gonna literally all be walking around with goggles? Are we all gonna be hooked up to machines at night, like heads down in VR? Like, are we gonna be running around, seeing people in the streets, like virtually shooting each other, like playing, you know, AR games? Um, I'll get started so I can give them some runway. Um, I'll say two main things. The solutions of the stories or the problems that we really solve. And there's uh, eight, what used to be called Luna, where the entire bed sheet is connected. And then there's entire beds that are connected. And then there's sensors that you put next to your bed and you use your phone. There's all sorts of ways to solve the same problem. So I think that actually be good for you to look at from a, like why you're doing it. Look at a place like this, like sleeping in the bedroom has been attacked by like 17 angles of how to get the same thing done. So you get a sense of Who's waiting? Who's losing? Why? Man, there is. It's still wide open. I was CEO of a mattress company for oh, five shit. weeks, like, about two months ago. <laughs> and uh, we raised her out in like five weeks, and then we disagreed with the partner, which uh, happens often. But I'll tell you, it's amazing. There's a lot of money, a tremendous amount of money, but actually, it's still, there's no great solution. So it's nice to cover it. A very long time ago, I worked in China supplying furniture and cabinetry to hotels all over the U.S. and in all of the West Coast. They, just probably 10 years ago, they already started trying to get these electronics integrated with those furniture. Your, your real business problems won't come from designing the electronics. It'll come from the aftermarket services when they start to break. And you've got to go around and figure out a solution for how you're going to go get these awesome and custom designed electronics to be fixed and replaced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you sit in chairs, you roll around and lay down on beds and stuff happens. And it's, it's uh, they looked into it, the company I was with at the time looked into it for a long time. And that I'm sure the electronics are better now than they were 10 years ago, especially coming out of China. There's been a leaps and bounds difference. But at the same time, and that aftermarket service, when you have something that's going through that amount of wear and tear, that's good stuff. <laughs> and the comfort. Yeah, right. I mean, side sleepers, back sleepers, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. dog and kids. Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we take a different angle for a second? So, just for fun, I would love all three of us, just because maybe you guys who would love this perspective. Like, what's going to be in our life in three years? What's real, what's not? I think there's a lot of hype around these categories. <laughs> I think it's really hard, um, and I always like it when people that know more than me break it down a little bit and say like, okay, I hear all this stuff, like, what the fuck is really, like, what's going on? Like, are we gonna literally all be walking around with goggles? Are we all gonna be hooked up to machines at night, like, heads down in VR? Like, are we gonna be running around, seeing people in the streets, like, virtually shooting each other, like, playing, you know, AR games? Um, I'll get started so I can give them some runway. Um, I'll say two main things. The solutions of the stories or the problems that we can really solve with AR and VR are going to happen very, very quickly, like much faster than I think we give credit for. So I think AR kit, which is what Apple calls it, it's just in your new phone when you upgrade to the new operating system for free, you now have it. Um, it's like the first thing in the app store, you'll see all these AR games uh, or, or utilities. 
the things that are obvious are going to happen super quickly. And, and if you start using it tonight or tomorrow when you have time to download it, I think your mind's going to shift pretty quickly. I think you're going to start seeing the world in a very different light almost instantaneously when you do stuff like measure something or lay furniture out in the room at the exact same size in the exact place you want. You walk around, look around it backwards, change the colors, you're going to like, holy shit, that's right this second. I think we saw with the app store and everything else, you have fart apps and you know, you have all these other dumb apps that come out, but you had stuff that blew your mind in the second generation of iOS that actually allowed developers to make cool stuff. So that's right this second. So if you don't think if you think it's the future, it's not, that's that's today. Um, in VR, I think that there's just actually probably more from spending time with Devin and Ben and the team is I was I was super blown away. And I bet most of you have it, but I have to find who's been in like a immersive full VR before? Raise hands. Cool, exactly. So uh, please go upstairs. So when you hear like the, the different heads, uh, headsets that Google makes, Facebook makes, that, uh, sorry, it's really just Google and uh, Samsung. It's just 360 video. When you can go like this, that's not video. So when you can see a video and look around and you can't move freely in space, uh, it's different. But please do that. Because that will give you a foundational understanding of where we really are today, and it will literally blow your mind. Like, immersive, like full VR today is already insane. It's, it's unbelievable. The problem is, it's expensive, the computer required is fucking massive, and the laptop is like, you know, the biggest laptop you've ever seen in your life. Um, it's not necessarily super portable, but I think the emotional ability which you can always talk about is something I was, I was blown away with. Like, the level of empathy the level of storytelling depth and how far removed you can get from reality. Like if you ever watched a movie in the movie theater, you're like, oh my god, I'm so touched by that movie. VR can blow that away. Like just at a level, that's today. So I, and that's my feeling, I mean I didn't come in the future, but like that's the second. And I'm kind of excited because you guys will walk upstairs if he's nice enough to sit around and actually play with the stuff and come see him again. Because he has all the tech in this building. So we're definitely highly recommend it. Well do you want to go first? I feel like I should go first so you can do the grand finale because I feel like he's going to be way cooler. But, um, no, I mean, I think you're right on in, in, in that, you know, I've never been a fan of the VR total. I think it's going to be games that are going to be awesome, right? Entertainment, games, they're going to be very immersive and that's going to be really cool. I've always been way more a fan of the VR. And, and there, it's going to be a lot of B2B stuff, right? It's going to be worker training, it's going to be quality control, it's going to be uh, healthcare, it's going to be um, nurses being able to evaluate patients when they come in much faster than, than they can now. Um, and it's, I, I don't, I, I think it will happen a lot more on the B2B side than it will on the, the B2C side, except in entertainment. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of really cool entertainment, certainly. Um, yeah. And there. Uh, and, well, um, yeah. Uh, so, in, well, in, in VR will be a lot more entertainment total. Um, the, the consumer side of AR, I think, will still be a little bit more entertainment based. But then there will be the cool measurement stuff and like the cool little things that are like the really simple, but it's just like, wow, this is, I wish I had this kind of life. And, 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 and especially like the IKEA, putting together IKEA furniture in the back is something. I mean, some stuff like that is, is really going to be game changing and it's going to be really simple. And it's going to really fit in with what a lot of the manufacturing stuff is, is working on, so that that will that will play well. Um, but but I do think in healthcare, especially. I mean, um, my partner Beth, you know, she just raised twenty million for Care Therapeutics, and they did this first digital app that was approved by the FDA um, for um, elderly care and Alzheimer's, and and I think that that kind of application in, in healthcare in general, they are. So, I mean, there's there's a couple ways I can kind of I can kind of go around this. So, the first thing I think uh, I think in the long term, say three to five years from now, I think this divide, this constant shifting of our language between AR and VR, and this this projection that people are getting AR, you know, they're looking at the uses now. And you're extrapolating, well, there's this much industry, it's this much easier to integrate AR, the hardware of VR is so big, it's so bulky. 
you know, there's so many barriers to putting anything on your head. Nobody wants to look stupid. And that's what everybody that worry, is worried about when you start doing this thing. Yeah. This is where I expect to so this is, so this is one of the things that people look now when they extrapolate out these big numbers. The problem is from the production side and from the way they think about integrating what's essentially a fictional experience into your real life. Right? I'm taking this, this image in my head and I'm putting it right next to me. That's what's happening. That's what makes it impactful. It has nothing to do with being able to look around and go, wow, I'm in the room. That's VR for the, that's VR for the sake of wowing somebody. That, that stuff fizzles out. There's a reason why all of this is stuck around. I'm taking these figures of imagination and making them real. I think that divide between AR and VR is going to blend. It's going to blend. I do think there will be a shift in practical uses versus entertaining uses, but I don't even think this... AR, the only reason we have AR on our phone right now is because our, we don't have many hologram projectors. Right? That's why we call it AR on our phone. Right? right now, our only hologram projectors are the HoloLens, and that doesn't have a great field of view. Well, that's going to change. It might take 10 years to change, but that's going to change. Right? In 10 years, you're not going to have VR headsets. You're going to have your first meeting on projection systems. It'll be like Star Wars, where they sit and they play the chess with the little creatures that walk on the table. Right? This is a projection system issue, and not maybe 10, maybe 20 years for that to eventually get to that level, but the basis of those technologies are already real. Right now, we have a bottleneck. And it is a hardware bottleneck, ironically, and it's this limitation. This is what I have, and this is what I have to deliver. So I think that's how people are crafting and framing their stories. I was talking to a very respected surgeon in the US. He just left Obama's health care council after the, the last presidential changeover. Does a lot of work in California, works with some of the major Silicon Valley hospitals. I asked him, I said, you must, of all people, you must have talked about AR and VR in assistance of surgery. Right, and the assistance of neurosurgery. And I go, you know, he goes, yeah, of course. He goes, we got one pitch a day from some company trying to come and get national healthcare funding in the U.S. to go research it. So we rejected it all. I said, well, why? He goes, look. He goes, it's all wonderful, but nothing replaces training a surgeon with the pressure, with the context of real life. And then we started having a few drinks, and we started kicking the idea around, and we came up with a solution that he said is amazing and simple in your work. And it was a very simple one. Your training is unbelievable. We put you in a situation, be it AR or VR, we start training and we make it so every time you fail. And we attach you know, results to that. So as surgeons come in, don't use VR to teach you how to succeed. Use VR to teach you how you can go wrong every single way possible. Get people frustrated, get them angry. It is unfair, it's supposed to be. You're a surgeon. Put it in that context and it'll work. So, again, I don't always view this stuff as a technology barrier. The, the, the tech is easy because we look at it and we like sparkly things and lighting things. That's why people like Macau in Vegas. It blinks, it sparkles, it lights up. Ooh, that's cool, but that's gone. Right? What we're doing is creating real feeling. And we create real feeling by taking what's going on in our imagination in our heads and putting it in front of us. That has industrial application, that has training application, that has entertainment application. But that type of a simple shift in your thinking, the idea that, wow, I can train you in an unbelievable situation. What type of pressure does that mean? Right? How do I understand that? It, it, it's, you have to shift your thinking. So I think in three years, what's really going to happen, aside from the computer's always constantly getting faster, the, you know, the way that data is transmitted, it's always going to get slightly better compressed. That, that's going to keep on happening. That's well, because of great guys working in hardware. It's always going to keep, keep going to get better and faster. But that's not what's going to solve this issue. What's going to solve it is people actually starting to experiment and connecting with it and then finding out the new ways to, to, to transmit that feeling. And I think that's already there. And in three years, we're going to see that stuff really start to blend. Uh, they, Pretty typical. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the first three years, like, like you got to think of this. Like, this is the best platform or medium to think about. We're going to have the same exact gold rush of all those developers. So you're going to have the tape measure and the fart app and the lightsaber and yeah. the and and the and, and all the basic stuff. 
that can be easily done in AR or VR is happening right away. The easy stuff is going to be the next two to three years. The hardware, like again, if you're looking at this, we'd love to be proven wrong, but everything I know about this space is it is so much further off than we'd like it to be. It's a physics problem. Ah, it's very, very But I like the way you phrase that. It's farther off than we'd like it to be. Because everybody wants to have that character from their childhood standing right next to them. It's farther off than we'd like it to be because we want the hologram right here in the room next to that's, that's our desire. But it's not farther off than we'd like it to be because it's an impossible problem. It's because we want it now. That's the feeling we get. When we put on this headset, we don't want to have a controller. We want to be right in a scene like the holodeck on Star Trek. <laughs> right? Damn it, why isn't it here this moment? And this is the thing, right? It's, it's this, this is why all writing about AR and VR, it's, it's always slanted one way or the other, depending on which side of the you're on. It's fascinating reading the articles about this stuff. But I'll give you one question, though. <laughs> this will not be the device. I don't see any future where we do this. No. At all. It just seems absolutely impossible to me. Coming from America and being in Asia, and how many people I've run into because of this, like, Asia is like the number one winner by a long shot of people that do this in public. Like, it, like you're, you win every time. Um, it's not natural. VR in a space like a uh, museum or in the car dealership or in your home or your office, that's natural because you're not moving. You're in a controlled space, you can't get hit by a car, you can't fall off a cliff. Like, it makes a lot of sense. It's going to be on your head or it's going to be some version of visit like your line of sight, some sort of visible yeah, object. I think it's going to be in your head. I think that's the big, that's where it's going to all change. I have, I think there, this, I'll give you the projection. 20 years, because it's going to take a fucking lot of effort. I don't think AR and VR are different either. I think it's going to be one device. It might have to be powered by some super, something like, this is just because it's the best computer right now. Once computers can be in a wearable form factor that are this strong and can power this kind of stuff, it will eventually disappear. And I think there'll be a, a merging of AR and VR where let's say your glasses right now, like this is my particular vision of the future, is you will have these glasses that can do the basics that VR can do today, and it just lets you navigate your life normal. It can show you maps, it can listen to your messages, you can listen to music, you can do whatever you normally do on a phone, but you don't have to be like this, doing it all the time. But then VR experiences are gonna be very hard to have because you do need to go all in. You need to be all the way cut off, you still need to be able to move. I think there'll be a modular version of this, and it'll be one platform. I don't see multiple platforms, I don't think we're all gonna have a Google this, and an Apple this, and an Amazon this, and a Facebook that, and a Huawei this, and I don't think that's the real world. I think we'll have to pick still. I don't think that's ever gonna change. Um, but I think you'll take those glasses, and you'll go to your house, you'll go to the office, or you'll go to the car dealership. And you'll be able to take your glasses on and put a larger object or slip them in, because the computer's gonna be your glasses. Let me ask you a question. Who here has like a little, a little kid around four years old, or a niece or a nephew, or, or some, some maybe a friend has a little kid around that age. Who here's got, has got some family or somebody with a little kid? Have you ever seen those little kids play with an iPad? <laughs> it's ridiculous if you've seen them, right? They know how to operate it better than you do half the time. They've gone and figured out, I have a, I have a little, little five-year-old nephew. Uh, he just turned five. And he knows how to turn on his Peppa Pig and all his cartoons and all this other stuff. He can operate better than my parents, than my parents, than his grandparents can. My daughter at three has <laughs> had like 20 functions in my phone yep. that I never knew existed. And, and one of the most entertaining things to do is to watch a little kid around that age who knows how to play with a, uh, a touchscreen phone or an iPad. Watch them walk up in the mall to one of these big large displays. Every single one of them, like a laser bolt, walks up and starts trying to hit the display. But it's, I, it's, it's, it's like moths to a flame. It's like they, 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 they can't help it. They want to go hit that display. That's within your generation. That's how fast people click. You'd show them an old cell phone, they wouldn't even know how to flip the phone open. They, would, they wouldn't even know what that would look like. So what's going on with this hardware aspect, this, in, this integration aspect of AR and VR, is two things. One, it's a hardware bottleneck, which I think we've covered pretty well today. But two, it's also a mentality. Would you be comfortable sitting at the office every day, popping on a HoloLens, and, and working from that instead of having your, your monitor? You don't know, because none of you have actually tried a HoloLens. If you want, you can come upstairs and try it. It's at the XBA, it's a great suggestion. But you can. You can sit there the entire day and have your office alone, or just aligned all around you, and you can take it with you. 
which everywhere you go, you pop it open, your pre-configured settings, it pops all around. Windows just this month, and I'm not a big Windows fan here, so I'm not just tooting everyone, but they did this. They just released their Windows Mixed Reality operating system. Any new Windows computer you get that's running Microsoft, as it's in the background, can run a holographic operating system, and all you need to do is buy a three to four hundred US dollar headset that you plug in in the new iteration, right? The original HoloLens was three thousand dollars. It's a dev kit. This now they're three hundred within one year. In a couple of years, provided people get comfortable working that way, you're not going to need monitors in your office. You just pop on your headset, and you can have your conversation window over here with somebody in five different offices. And you can have your personalized setup over here. It, the way that this stuff is happening is the same way that when phones changed from being a tool to communicate to a tool to run your life. It's the same way that this stuff is going to happen. You're not going to need a TV screen or a monitor. You're going to have your device. Right? Those devices will get smaller. Eventually, they'll disappear. There'll be holograms projected everywhere. But that's great. It's already here. Right, and what's happening now is we're getting this weird push and pull between what people are comfortable with and the actual usefulness of reducing their barrier to work and communication in life. And the only way I can prove to you is that it's working is even with the existing hardware and tech of today, we're making a company out of that. It does work. Yes, it takes right. planning. Right. Right. <laughs> it takes a lot of planning. You don't just like throw it out there. You don't do AR for the sake of making AR. You don't do VR for the sake of making VR. You do projects and you build these concepts because they work better with an AR application or a VR application. You don't just do it to show that you're in AR. And the tip, the tip yeah. there is because it's better, you, you have to A, you have to try these things. Yeah. So if I can give you any tip, if you're not on iOS 11 or whatever version, like get up yeah. to the latest and try it right now. Get into a full VR experience, try it, because I promise you if you haven't, I know because I've done this, you have no fucking clue. You haven't it. tried it at the moment in Hong Kong. It's, it's very different when you're in a full VR setup. And then the, the last part is if you're an entrepreneur and you have ideas, this is really critical, especially if you're trying to make software or services or content for this new platform or these new platforms or hardware. The challenge with both of these, the software layer, the new app developers of this, this generation, the last 10 years, building what these guys build is a thousand times harder. Like, it's not even remotely the same challenge. The, the dev kits are helpful. But to tell a great story, to make a great you know, experience, is not simple. So you need a bigger team, just like hardware, the normal SaaS companies. You need, like an app company, you can have two dudes, or one guy. Like the basic VR team is going to be like six people. Yeah. And it's very hard. But if you're trying to solve any problem you're interested in, don't build for today's platforms. You need to try these, because this is our real life. So if you have an idea right now, and you want to be relevant in three years, AR is a real thing. VR is a real thing. Don't build for the way you think today. And the only way you can change that thinking is by getting into this world. Try HoloLens blew my mind. Like they, I kept going to their office and taking it all the time because I, I, cool. I it, there's nothing there's nothing quite like it when you see a hologram in front of you the first time. I, it's a hologram. It's a, it's, it, it, it is a hologram, right? It's not a it's so not a 2D. It it's not a little sprite flying around. Sure. So like, like, why don't we call it a little earlier? How many stations do you have? Uh, guys, so I, think, I think this was very interesting. Oh, Let so me it, uh, <laughs> we talked about a lot of uh, uh, deep and interesting ideas of how to make to the future. Let me close it with a very simple remark on a very simple experiment that I did this morning that definitely cost, uh, uh, cost me some help and some, uh, some uh, negative remarks from my wife. So I experimented an AR game with our son, three years old. So we talked about uh, earlier about uh, some of us have uh, young children. So among those of you who have young children, who knows the very hungry caterpillar? Yeah, very, very. So the very hungry caterpillar is a book about a caterpillar who on Monday eats one apple, on Tuesday eats two plums, and he goes to sleep, on Wednesday eats two bears, and he goes to sleep. And eventually, after eating and sleeping, he, he becomes a cocoon and becomes a beautiful butterfly. Beautiful story, very nice illustrated. On uh, iOS now, there's an AR game, a very happy caterpillar. And uh, uh, this morning, I just uh, took out the iPhone and uh, we played five minutes. First, uh, my son went, uh, was a bit impatient because nothing was happening, but eventually there was an interact with the caterpillar. He immediately understood how to 
top or to have an apple come down from the tree or to have a, a plant disappear. After five minutes, he was really addicted to five minutes. Huh? And then it took us five minutes to make him stop. He did the same game that all the other people did from, from a while, of course. But the important thing is that, uh, remember, so these are the traits of the story. There's the egg that hatches, the caterpillar comes out, uh, he eats, and then he sleeps, uh, he eats, and he sleeps, and then he becomes a good uh, and then a bad one. These are the elements of the story. In the, in the one hour, so this, all this happened before seven this morning. Then between 7 and 8, because the breakfast, play is usual, we're going to school in this one hour after the only 10 minutes experience they have. Very simple associations. We were chatting, we were playing, we were playing with the cars, and he said, okay, now the cars go to sleep. He thought, oh, sleep. And the caterpillar, he said, I want to play with the caterpillar. He was still feeling in his mind. Then we saw an egg, we were having breakfast, but the egg, like the caterpillar, Everything in the, in the hour, the, the few minutes experience was so vivid from a phone, from a simple caterpillar that in the entire hour afterwards you kept going back to it. This is how vivid, how uh, a very basic, today very basic AR can be in the mind of someone who experiences it for the first time. And yeah, so this is really the, the power of, of AR and uh, joined with the data coming from IoT and you know, uh, countless applications. I really, I'd really like to thank uh, Mary, Greg, and Debbie for, for uh, contributing their experience and time tonight, and, and all of you for, for being here. Thank you very much.